So good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our 2014 commencement. Uh, we were commenting just now that uh, commencement is a very strange word because to any Italian means the beginning of something. And you think, well, no, this is when we're celebrating the PhD student who actually completed their process and now are doctors. So I guess the meaning, but this might be a postdoc interpretation that we apply to it, is that uh, it's actually the beginning of uh, uh, real life. Um, so <laughs> something that we celebrate because it's now uh, a big challenge for which we, of course, wish you all the best. Um, so I'll make this brief introduction in English and in Italian because we are in an international center and an international doctoral program based in Italy. Um, e quindi prima di tutto allora ringrazio uh, per la vostra presenza uh, oggi um, oggi uh, facciamo uh, questo uh, evento tutti gli anni lo facciamo perché uh, ci sembra molto importante come momento per uh, um, riconoscere e apprezzare il lavoro degli studenti di dottorato per tutto il periodo in cui sono qui con noi al CIMEC e per apprezzare l'importante eh, traguardo che hanno raggiunto eh, di eh, avere appunto un dottorato di ricerca eh, e oggi celebriamo i, dottor, i dottori di ricerca che hanno concluso eh, presentando il loro lavoro lunedì scorso eh, che sono eh, Michela Malfatti eh, Michela Malfatti ha fatto una tesi eh, sotto la supervisione di eh, Liliana Albertazzi Uh, ha esplorato quelle che sono le associazioni tra uh, le forme e i colori uh, nella popolazione, uh, di fatto espandendo la nostra conoscenza circa il fatto che non solo le persone cosiddette sinestetiche hanno uh, queste esperienze sistematiche di associazione fra forme e colori, ma anche le persone uh, che non hanno queste esperienze di sinestesia e quindi rileva, rivelando di fatto eh, alcuni dei meccanismi eh, che stanno dietro la nostra eh, rappresentazione di questi eh, oggetti del mondo. David Pascucci, eh, David Pascucci è stato supervisionato da Massimo Turatto in questi anni eh, e ha esaminato i meccanismi eh, dell'apprendimento della plasticità nel sistema visivo umano, studiando come questi eh, interagiscano con i meccanismi di ricompensa. Eh, continuerà eh, le sue ricerche eh, all'Università di Verona dove ha avuto eh, un postdoc eh, per continuare appunto eh, il suo mh, percorso eh, e infine Reshan Reader supervisionata da Mario Spelen eh, Reshan ha esplorato eh, la incredibile e sorprendente capacità che abbiamo di riconoscere rapidamente in maniera estremamente efficiente anche in un'immagine complessa alcuni oggetti e nel fare questo quindi sostanzialmente è andata a indagare i meccanismi uh, di uh, ricerca visiva che mettiamo in atto quotidianamente nell'ambiente. Anche uh, Reshan ha cominciato già uh, il suo uh, postdottorato, che è la ragione per cui non può essere qui oggi con noi, uh, all'Università di Magdeburg in Germania. Um, so I'll now switch to English. Uh, so we are here to celebrate today uh, the three Uh, uh, doctors that uh, successfully completed their uh, PhD program um, in uh, uh, last Monday uh, and defended very well uh, uh, in front of a very determined and uh, uh, active uh, committee uh, their positions. So the first is Michela Malfatti. Uh, she completed a thesis under the supervision of Liliana Albertazzi. She explored the associations between shapes and colors in the population, expanding our knowledge about the fact that even non synesthetes can experience systematic links between certain shapes and certain colors. Uh, David Pascucci was supervised by Massimo Turatto. David examined the mechanisms of learning and plasticity in the human visual system, studying how these interact with reward. Uh, he will now continue with the postdoc at the University of Verona in Italy. And finally, Brishan Reader was supervised by Marius Palin, uh, and Brishan explored the remarkable fast and efficient ability we have to search for objects 
uh, of interest in the complex and cluttered visual scene. She has now already started uh, a three-year postdoc at the University of Magdeburg in Germany, and that's the reason why uh, she is not here at the moment. The two speakers today, and we're very glad to have them here, are uh, Ioni, or Ioni Fine, uh, who's Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Washington. Ioni studies the mechanisms of plasticity in the human brain, and she's one of the leading scientists in the study of the effects of blindness on the visual pathways. Uh, and now, uh, also, uh, she's exploring the consequences of retinal prosthesis, so very much making a very important link between all this theoretical knowledge that uh, we have uh, built over the last years with the actual possibility of uh, creating prosthesis for blind people. And of course, all this is expanding into the general domain of neural prosthesis uh, that is starting to uh, dominate uh, the, the, the field. Uh, Godfrey Boyton is also associate professor at the University of Washington and he studies the effect of attention on the representation of stimuli in the human visual cortex. His research has greatly contributed to showing that the way we perceive the environment in, in vision as well as other sensory modalities is heavily influenced by our attention and more generally what we are expecting to perceive, which is a very pers important perspective change that occurred uh, in the last decades. So please join me in welcoming uh, Hayoni and Jeff today. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's really exciting to be here, and I'm really looking forward to giving this talk. And secondly, congratulations. Everything will be easy from now on. <laughs> So when I was asked to, um, when we were, we were asked to give a joint talk, and um, I was asked for title in the middle of Society for Neuroscience, and this is sort of a picture of a very small part of the poster session. This year I think they had 32,000 people there. And when you're in the middle of Society for Neuroscience, you feel like an, don't laugh, an achuge, a little anchovy in a huge ball of anchovies. And you feel, in some ways, it's very exciting because there is all this science happening. And in some ways, it's kind of humiliating because you feel so small and so insignificant and like an achuge. That really isn't going down well, is it? <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Um, and so when I was thinking about the talk, and I remembered something, and I was thinking about commencements and starting a career, and I remembered something somebody had told me just before I finished my PhD, which is that if you take all the scientists that are dead, the Newtons, the Francis Cricks, the, um, all the famous scientists that have now, I can't, I cannot think of any because I'm nervous. Um, I know more than two scientists, really, normally. If you take all the dead ones, and you stack them all up. There are not as many dead scientists as there are living scientists alive and working now. That's really quite true. And that, again, is terrifying. But one thing it means is it, it means that science moves incredibly quickly now. And amazing transformations that maybe only happened every couple of hundred years now happen in 10 or 5 or 3. And that makes it a really exciting time for you to be scientists. If you think about the amount of time it took to discover about gravity and put a man on the moon, now think about the amount of time it took before we learned about DNA and the time that we're going in and putting gene therapies in people with blindness diseases. In one case, it took hundreds of years. In the other, it took tens of years. Things move very fast. This is a very exciting time to be a scientist, even if one is only a little achuga in the scientific process. So what Jeff and I are going to talk about, because this is a commencement, is actually things that happened a long time ago in our careers, when we were sort of commencing 
And we're going to talk about the fact that in this time when science is moving so fast, you often, or hopefully, you will have these very exciting times in your career where you really are, the career is, op the field is opening up very fast and in a very exciting way, in the same way as an explorer landing in America. And thus, that's why I chose the title, Thus in the Beginning, All the World is America. Jeff is going to talk about early days when he was studying attention and fMRI. And I'm going to talk about um, several years I spent looking in um, try studying patients who had had the first visual implants, prosthesis implanted. And at this point, I will pass on to Jeff. How's that back there? Is that all right? Please let me know if you can't hear anything. So is this going to be down here? Can move this up here, or, is this, or bad, bad things going to happen if I try to move this up to the podium? Yikes. Yes. All right. And thanks again also for having me here. This is a, this is a real pleasure to visit this part of the, of the country. It's beautiful out here. Um, so when we were asked to give this talk, I realized it was right around my, around my 50th birthday. And I realized, well, this is, I finally earned the right to give an old, an old person's talk. So uh, those of you who know anything about vision and fMRI and attention, this will be a little bit redundant. But I thought I'd give some perspective of what it was like back then to do some of this research and finish up on some current stuff. Um, about the time of my commencement, when I was a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara, uh, this was the cover of Science Magazine from a paper by um, uh, Seiji Ogawa. Um, and at the time I was doing was even at the time old school visual psychophysics on pattern vision and temporal processing. And this just completely, it blew my mind. It's like, well, this is what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to figure out what's going on inside the head. And of course, this is the first image of uh, MRI, functional MRI. It was an extri extrinsic signal at the time, but soon afterward, there were the flurry of papers that came out showing that you could use somewhat normal MRI scanners to measure blood flow and oxygenation changes in the human brain to get estimates of, of, of functional processing. And at the time, we had EEG, um, which is our best measure of signals in the human brain. But this seemed amazing to be able to localize like this. And most influential uh, to me it was this paper 20 years ago from Steve Engel uh, when he was a graduate student about to commence uh, at Stanford uh, with Brian Wendell and all these other interesting people on that paper. Um, back in the days where you could write a paper with a title, fMRI of Human Visual Cortex, and get it in, into nature. Um, it was the first paper showing retinotopic um, mapping using these, the traveling wave technique. And that was when I decided I wanted to do this. I wanted to study the human brain using fMRI. I finagled my way into a postdoc with, Steve, uh, with David Heeger, who at the time um, actually was a pure theori theoretician. He hadn't gathered a single data point in his career. But he was at Stanford and down the hall from Brian Wendell. And so it was a perfect setup. Um, but what was weird about this, and so I, I was really kind of the second generation of fMRI researchers. The, the, pion, the real pioneers were the ones who figured out how to get the signal off the scanner and, and, and uh, tweak all the parameters and get it to work. I was very lucky. The, the, the data was coming off the machine at the time that I showed up. But we didn't know what to do with it. And I like to, uh, to think of this as sort of the time where we'd suppose um, you're an astronomer, and a physicist gives you an astronomer. A physicist gives you this new machine that can point to the stars, and it says, "Look, it's better than any other machine we have. It looks, it, it can give you high resolution images of the stars and the planets." But we don't know how it works. Um, what would you do with it? And the first thing you might do is, is point it up uh, at the uh, galaxies in the universe and, and try to figure out what's going on out there. And that's what people were doing. People were going in the scanner and doing, you know, playing chess and doing ridiculous things like that. But we really didn't know what we were measuring. And so what I wanted to do, and David Heger and I wanted to do, was point this machine at an object or a system that we understood better. Like, what I would do is point at the moon. We've been there. We know what it looks like up close. And in our world, in vision, we wanted to study, say, primary visual cortex using visual stimuli that were very well um, understood, um, say, using monkey physiology experiments in the primary visual cortex, where we know what the signal should look like, at least in a, in a close relative of humans. Um, 
And at the time, what we knew about fMRI, and this is not a whole lot less than what we know now, uh, is that there have to be two things work out really well to make fMRI work. One has to do with the way the brain works, and one has to do with physics. Most of you already know this. Uh, in the brain, um, for some reason, there's an increase um, in local blood oxygenation where there's brain activity. It's actually the opposite direction of what people originally thought there might be. You might think there'd be a decrease due to oxygen consumption. But no, there's an increase in oversupply. And in physics, it turns out that oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, red and blue blood, have different magnetic properties. Deoxygenated hemoglobin is a paramagnetic contrast agent, which is a statement that I've tried to memorize over the years. Um, and it just works out that with T2 star imaging, MR images are brighter where there's greater brain activity. And this is just luck. We got lucky. You can get the sign right, that the, the numbers go up where there's more activity. Could have gone the other way, right? And that's about all we knew. So what do you, what do, you do with a system like that? Uh, we know the blood oxygenation um, responses are slow compared to the neural responses, um, but we didn't know much more than that. And so the first thing we decided to do, which is you can think of it, is a pilot experiment to just measure the signals over time to see if they're behaving reasonably. And reasonably, from my background in math before this, the best possible system would be a linear system where, um, well, I'll define what that means in a second, and this is basically the model that we came up with that we published in, in 99, 96. Um, the idea is that if you know the response of a linear system to a brief pulse, an impulse, in theory it's an infinitely short you know, unit length, unit size pulse, but in our case it would be like a flash of a flickering checkerboard to a subject in the scanner. If you knew the, the, the actual time course of the response to a pulse and the system's linear, then the point is you should be able to measure or predict the time course of the response to any other possible input. And the reason why is that with a linear system, you have this property called superposition, which means that their outputs simply add <clears throat> on top of each other, and there's no saturation. So if I produce two pulses, one after the other, the second occurs while the first one's happening, it produces its own impulse, and the output is actually just the sum of the two. It's actually a lot to ask for between this cascade of events, between neural activity and this blood flow thing. <clears throat> but it'd be a nice thing to have. Next thing is scaling and shift invariance. Shift invariance means the impulse response function stays the same over time. It doesn't get faster or slower due to the state of the observer. And the second one is if you double the strength of the neural response, you should double the strength and the magnitude of the, of the hemodynamic response. Again, a lot to ask for. And then the idea is, by simply thinking of, a, of any input stimulus as a, a, a sequence of shifted and scaled impulses, uh, then you should be able to predict the output by simply a bunch of shifted and scaled impulse, response, impulse responses. And so fun things happen. For example, if you have a linear system, the output, if you send in a sinusoid, the output is always a sinusoid. It's kind of a cool fact. It's just shifted and scaled. And there's sort of block design, on-off design will give you something that's roughly sinusoidal in time. So anyway, we wanted to test this, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. We just simply had subjects line the scanner, and this is the days when the subjects were Steve Engel and I, <laughs> two subjects. Um, and we simply measured the response to flickering checkerboards of different durations and intensities. Intensity in the visual system would be the contrast of the flickering checkerboard. And shown here uh, are simply the time course of the responses to stimuli of different durations, so 3 seconds, 6, 12, and 24, in different stimulus contrasts. And if we have a linear system, then what we should have here is these time courses should just simply be um, scaled versions of each other. In other words, doubling the contrast of the stimulus should, should not necessarily double the strength of the output because we've got this nonlinearity called the brain. Um, but um, the time courses, as far as fMRI is concerned, should be the same. And if you look at this, it's pretty true that the, the time courses are pretty much um, consistent with each other. And that's really important if you think about it. If the fMRI time courses varied with stimulus strength, then we wouldn't know what the time course of the signal to look for in our data without knowing the strength of the neural response, which is what we're trying to find out in the first place. So it's a real problem. So we, got, we were very happy to see that. Um, and then um, I'll skip that. The other idea is if you use a block design experiment, the amplitudes of the signal should vary in a systematic way um, and should not interact with the strength of the stimulus. And so we came up with a model that predicted these time courses. And for the most part, it's actually a, here's a lesson for you guys. Uh, it was a, we, the way we wrote the paper was, the system, it was called linear systems analysis. So we were uh, 
agnostic about whether it was actually linear. Uh, it turns out that, for the most part, it's a quite a linear system. Uh, it turns out, though, that for very short stimulus durations, we get a larger than expected uh, fMRI response. And that's been replicated in other domains and in the visual system many times. Um, and so people cite this paper for saying it's both linear and nonlinear. So that's a good way of getting lots of citations for your paper. Um, but it, it, it turns out that, um, here, I'll back up. It turns out that the, the assumption of linearity is the backbone of almost all fMRI data analysis packages, SPM. Any, any general linear model, there it is, the word linear, uh, assumes a shift invariant linear system that's coupling between the neural response and the fMRI response. And I just, we are very, very, very lucky that this complicated system that we still don't understand um, is, can be pretty reasonably approximated by a linear system. If not, it would be a disaster, and we wouldn't still be um, scanning, I think, the way we do now. So we got lucky. Um, anyway, what to do with this? Uh, the last project I did as a postdoc was to start studying uh, attention. And at the time, in 1997 or so, um, this is the early days of studying visual attention in monkey physiology. So John Monsell's work and, and Desmond's work in V4 um, were showing that attention would modulate the neural responses in monkey physiology um, data in relatively early visual areas, V4 and MT, or V5, if you want to call it here. And that seemed crazy at the time, because it was relatively early in the visual processing stream. And we thought that early stages of visual processing were part of, like, we say, a feed-forward passive image processing machine. Things like attention were stuff that happened, you know, George Sperling studied attention. It's all in the front of the head. Um, but we decided to basically, and what I've done throughout my career, is read the monkey physiology literature and see if we find the same thing in humans. And so what we did was train up our subjects. In this case, our subjects were me and uh, Sunil Gandhi, who was an undergraduate in the lab. <clears throat> Uh, to uh, do a spatial attention uh, experiment. And this paradigm was actually developed by Ron Mangan for, for PET uh, years before, so it's not even a new paradigm. It was just a new machine. And the, and the trick, the experiment is the world's simplest attention experiment you could possibly do. Subjects fixate in the center of the screen. Two visual stimuli are presented left and right of fixation. They're moving gratings. And subjects are asked to do a speed discrimination task on either the left grating or the right grating. And we did a classic of lock design where the subjects did the task on the left side for about 20 seconds and then the right side for 20 seconds. Crucially, the visual stimulus did not change with the task. That's the rules of attention study. You keep, keep the stimulus constant, change the task, see what happens in, in the head. And because the visual system is lateralized, stimuli on the left side of the visual field are processed in the right visual cortex and vice versa, you have a nice uh, paradigm where you can measure the response to a stimulus that was attended or unattended as you alternate your attention back and forth. And what you get, this is a cheesy movie that I made on my own brain, my own 30-year-old brain, um, showing, uh, this is back in the days when we only had a single slice, too. When I was a kid, we only had one slice. Um, through the occipital lobe. And highlighted in blue uh, is the location of the primary visual cortex, or a best guess of the primary visual cortex at the time. And I'm going to just show a simple movie of what happens as, and there, there was no yellow circle in the real experiment, just to show you where I was attending. And this movie is sped up by a factor of about 10. Um, what happens to the blood flow and oxygenation changes is I switch my attention back and forth. And the important thing is the visual stimulus was constant. At the time, we were expecting to, we were preparing to study area MT, or V5, which is out here, motion processing regions, because that's where the monkey physiologist found the result, right? That's where um, Stefan Troy and um, John Monsell and those guys. And what we found, surprisingly, was not only did at V5 show an attentional effect, but inside this blue region right here, the primary visual cortex, we found robust effects of attention, <laughs> which was not expected. In fact, we'd, we'd, Sunil and I had been training in the lab for months through the summer on this, this speed discrimination task, assuming that the only reason why these physiologists were getting these attentional effects is because their monkeys were overtrained. Um, so we spent months just doing speed, still really good at speed discrimination tasks, or this part of the visual field. Um, and so anyway, it turns out you can take anybody off the street, throw them in the scanner, tell them to do this, and it'll work. Um, but we didn't know that. And if you quantify the results, it turns out you get a nice effect in V1. Um, 
and this is one of those things in science where if, if everything's set up right, the machine is built and everybody knows there's a paradigm to do this from PET imaging, um, three papers, ours and two others, came out right around the same time showing the same thing, that the primary visual cortex in humans, as far as fMRI is concerned, show robust attentional effects for spatial attention. We had a hard time getting this published, actually, because people didn't want to believe this. V1, there was heresy. V1 is not affected by attention. What are we talking about? Um, anyway, so more studies on attention. I'll go through these relatively quickly. It turns out that if you measure the strength of spatial attention as far as fMRI is concerned, it's a function of stimulus contrast. We found that there's a big story about whether it's contrast gain or response gain. We find with fMRI over and over again that the magnitude of the, of the signal change is attended versus an unattended stimulus does not change with the strength of the stimulus. <clears throat> again, this is really hard to publish because the monkey physiology editor didn't want to believe this. Um, but it's been replicated several times by other, by other labs. And I'm still thinking hard about why this is, why this is the case compared to, because it's not consistent with the monkey physiology data. But it is a fact. Um, also, we find that um, there's the idea that if you attend to the motion of a stimulus or the contrast of the stimulus, you're going to basically selectively modulate different parts of the brain that are, selected, that are selective to that stimulus feature. As far as V1 is concerned, we found that it doesn't vary much in its intentional effect when you're attending to either the contrast or the speed of the stimulus. It's not totally consistent with the literature, but the effects that other people have found are relatively small compared to the overall effect. So it does look like as long as you're attending to a visual stimulus, you get this enhanced response in the fMRI signal to that stimulus. It doesn't seem to matter how strong the physical stimulus was or the actual the task that you're performing, which is kind of weird. Um, later on, when I was down at the Salk Institute, um, we were reading monkey physiology papers, and this was the early days of studying feature-based attention. And so we decided to, run a, to basically run a monkey physiology study in humans on feature-based attention. And, the, and the, the paper that influenced us most was this paper by um, Stefan Troya um, in Nature showing that if you have monkeys, measure area V5 or MT, and on one side of the visual field, you have uh, overlapping fields of actually, you know, well, a single field of dots moving either up or down, and the monkey's performing a task over here, but you measure the response in area MT or V5 to an unattended stimulus, my mouse isn't showing up, uh, part C, to an unattended stimulus over there, the, the response to the unattended stimulus is modulated by what the monkey is attending to elsewhere. And if you're measuring from an upward selective neuron, and you present an upward selective uh, moving dot stimulus inside the receptive field of that neuron, the response to that neuron will be greater if the monkey is attending to upward motion elsewhere versus down. And they called it a global feature-based feature -based attention effect. And the idea is that if, if I'm attending to upward motion over here, then all neurons in my visual system that are selected to upward motion actually have an enhanced response outside the spatial focus of attention. Who knows what this is good for? It might be good for visual search. Uh, it might be good if it works for color. It might be good for saying finding a red book on a shelf because once you think I'm looking for something red, um, once I'm looking for something red, all of the neural responses to red stimuli become enhanced and helps me filter out un you know, irrelevant stimuli. In the scanner, simple experiment, we simply had overlapping fields of dots on the unattended side of the visual field, and on the unattended side, we had a single field of dots, say, moving upward. And as the subject alternated their, their task between attending to the upward or downward dots, we ignored the response to the attended stimulus, and we measured the response to the unattended stimulus. And sure enough, it modulated over time. Um, here. It modulated over time, um, even though the physical stimulus was constant. When you attended to the direction of motion that matched the unattended stimulus, the fMRI response went up, and then it went down when you attended the opposite direction. We found the same thing for color, interestingly, too. We're overlapping colored dots. The unattended stimulus was res response was greater when you attended to the same color as the, <clears throat> when the unattended stimulus had the same color as the attended dots. Um, and I'm just going to cross visual areas. Um, and so I did a bunch of work on divided, on, on, on feature-based attention, and it just does look like that for a vi variety of features, and this has been studied by various other people, including David, um, where if, uh, it does look like when you're attending to a particular feature, like an orientation, direction of motion, or a color, all neurons that are selective to that attended feature seem to show an enhanced response and perhaps a suppression of responses to stimuli that do not share the attended feature. 
current directions. What I'm doing now is to see what happens when we ask people to do two tasks at once, divide attention across different locations or maybe different features. That's what, this is new stuff for me. I only have like one data graph for this. Uh, it's a big deal for people that are interested in the ability of driving on this. That's a great picture of people eating and driving and um, talking on the phone at the same time. It does seem like some tasks you can do simultaneously and some you can't. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that inside the brain. It's relatively um, new area of research for fMRI. Um, and again, there's a monkey physiology study that really inspired us to do an fMRI version of it. And it's a paper by um, Yael, in Yael Seidemann's lab, Chan Seidemann, showing uh, an optical imaging study where a monkey was presented four stimuli in periphery um, and asked to either, asked, they trained the monkey to either uh, focus on one location or possibly four locations. And at the time, and then soon afterward, one of um, um, well, four gratings show up, in the, and, um, and one of them, you can't really see it, is actually a, uh, um, a plaid pattern that's a cross-oriented uh, grating on top of that. The monkey has to respond whether or not the plaid showed up in the region that they were supposed to be attending. And what they found was really kind of interesting. You'd think that maybe one of, one of two things could happen. Surely, when you're attending to a stimulus, the optical imaging response to the attended stimulus should go up. Now, what happens when it's one of four possible locations? You might still expect an attentional effect, but maybe it would be weaker, as though this spotlight of attention was diffuse, and it wasn't, you, you, have, you don't have the ability to spread your attention to four locations as well as one. What they found was interesting. They found, here's the optical imaging response to a single stimulus that was attended, it's focal attention. Here's the optical imaging response to um, an uncued stimulus, an unattended stimulus. So this is your basic spatial attention effect in monkey V1, by the way. Um, and then finally, though, if the stimulus is one of, the of one of four possible locations to be attended, the optical imaging response goes back up, and it's as strong as though it were the only stimulus being attended. So for this particular task in area V1, if if, you're, if, if the location is one of any possible locations that are behaviorally relevant, you seem to get the same boost in the optical imaging response, um, even though it's one of many possible locations to attend. Um, we, this is our last data slide, we basically did this in the scanner, had subjects attend to either one location or four possible locations. Skipping the details, we had behavioral data showing that, um, that if the stimulus is so it's, we're actually just detecting a horizontal target on top of a vertical grating. And the ability to detect that thing, um, if it's one of four possible, if it's the only location it could possibly be, you have a particular D prime um, signal to that. If it's an unattended stimulus, you don't see it very well. You, don't, you can't detect it. Strangely, if it's one of four possible locations, you're actually just about as good at detecting the stimulus as though it were the only one you're attending. So the divided, the undivided attention effect is just as strong behaviorally. And sure enough, in the scanner, we found the same sort of thing that E.L. Sonneman's lab found, that an unattended stimulus, this is the basic spatial attention effect here, cued, uncued, focal uncued. But if it's one of four possible locations, the response to any of the four locations is just as large as though it was the only location being attended. Now, mo the caveat here, most behavioral studies in divided attention show an effect where it is harder to divide attention across multiple stimuli. This happens to be one task where there is not an effect, and we find the corresponding result in V1. Now, what we're doing now is going back to more traditional tasks where we do find divided attentional effects, and the question is, what happens in V1? Is, it, is there a corresponding signal there? So that's what we're doing now. Um, and the idea, in summary, it does look like, for spatial attention, you can think of taking your stimulus and throwing it in a two-dimensional space here, where space might be one axis, feature being the other, say, direction of motion. Spatial attention would be like simply attending to one location in space, regardless of the feature. And it does look like whatever feature you're, if you, even if you're attending to a specific feature, like that dot right there, in a particular direction of motion, um, all neurons that are selected to that particular location seem to have an enhanced response. Likewise, for feature-based attention, we find the opposite effect. All neurons, like I said, that are selected to a particular feature seem to get an enhanced response regardless of their spatial preference, their receptive fields. And the new stuff is for divided attention, it looks like you're able, at least for this one particular task, you're able to divide attention across two different spatial locations with an equal enhancement in this signal. 
Um, while we switch microphones, I just want to throw up the names of the people that have worked with me on this, starting down the, the hierarchy of my postdoc supervisor to my current colleagues to graduate students and postdocs that have worked with me over the years on this stuff. Um, thanks. We can deal with questions after, right? You can all hear me? Okay, change of scene. So around the same time as Jeff was studying feature-based attention, I was on the job market. And because we were a couple, it was quite tricky because anyone on the East Coast or the Midwest or anyone sort of outside California sort of assumed I wasn't interested, which was a nice um, feeling that, it was nice that they thought I was so devoted to Jeff. I'm not sure it was true. Um, but luckily, I was recruited by a company called Second Sight, who were building retinal prostheses for people who are blind due to macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa. And I remember, because you know, I was very much a kind of nerdy little academic, going to the interview, and there were these very actually sort of, they looked like the doctors in ER. They were very glamorous in LA, and they were wearing these extremely expensive suits. And, I felt like I was auditioning for some sort of strange sitcom like ER and that, you know, I was meant to take my hair, it was in a kind of tight bun and I was meant to pull it out and take off my glasses and somehow, you know, be more glamorous. Um, but despite the fact that I never made it on the glamour front, they did hire me in the end. And so I kind of started this sort of very new and different stage of my career where I actually left academics for um, about four or five years and worked with um, retinal prostheses. And this is the latest promotional video of Second Sight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this video, which is kind of very futuristic, to put it politely. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the realities and where, kind of where we are. And kind of, I, I think this is exciting in a really sort of way. In Second Sight's Argus II retinal prosthesis system, a miniature video camera in the eyeglasses captures the scene. Video is processed by a small portable unit and transformed into instructions which are sent back to the glasses. These instructions are then transmitted wirelessly to the implant on the eye. The implant consists of a receiver and an array of electrodes. Instructions are received and corresponding signals sent to the array which emits small pulses of electricity. These pulses stimulate the retina's remaining cells and are transmitted down the optic nerve, conveying visual information to the brain, which perceives patterns of light. Patients learn to interpret these visual patterns. There you go. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't bag on my own company. So the next movie I'm going to play you, and then after that I will actually talk, is a movie of someone actually using these prosthesis, actually three individuals. This is quite a recent movie. Um, and I want you to feel my conflict when I watch this movie. At one level, I'm awestruck. These are people who are fully blind, who can see something. That is amazing. On the other hand, their vision is terrible. And these tasks, you know, so I want you to kind of get across this sort of like watching how they do these tasks just that this is not sight restoration or sight recovery. This is something very different. So I just kind of set you up to kind of feel that ambivalence. Oh, if I actually managed to play it. I think it is actually. This song must be. What? Le 9, je pense. Oui, le 9. C'est bon, ça. Ça, c'est le 5, je pense. Oui, 5. Voilà.
Say it all. Yes. Now over there, what you can actually see is what the image is on the array yes. and the electrodes that are being stimulated. So you can see she's not seeing the whole letter. Is this called smaller? Yes. Uh, I don't know. So up yes. there is, she's looking at a projector and then the camera of the array is giving okay. her that image yes. and then the other thing is showing, the dots are showing the electrodes. Okay. Yes. See? Yes. Can I? Yeah. Yes. Hello. So Jeff was complaining about the fact that in the early days of fMRI, he only got one slice, one slice. Well, you can see that in this early days of prosthetics, we're probably even worse off. And this is just to sort of orient you again. So I'm going to talk about two different sorts of arrays. In both of them, there's actually a subdermal wire that goes from a subdermally implanted receiver and then there's a clip on the outside. That technology is actually stolen from the cochlear implant technology. And then the wire goes through into the eye and onto a little um, electrode array. And that's a picture of an actual electrode array against the eye. So you get a sense of its size. And this is actually an image, a fundus image of the eye with an electrode implanted on it. So one is the, the um, 16 electrode the 16 electrode array, four by four, that some of the data I'm going to talk about are at. And these are a 60 electrode array, which is the ones that people are using um, now. Some of the data I have is from one of those. It doesn't make much difference, actually. Um, so just again, an orientation slide. Light comes into the eye. It hits the retina. And the cones are, of course, at the back of the retina because we are very badly designed, unlike the octopus. The octopus actually has an eye that's designed correctly, but in our case, the light has to travel through the retina into the photoreceptors. In people with macular degeneration or retinitis pigmentosa, these photoreceptors are gone. And the arrays that we were using are actually implanted on the ganglion cell side, mainly for two reasons. First of all, it's much easier to do the surgery because you just have to get into the eye. You don't have to squeeze it in between the retina and the choroid. And also because when you put you stimulate with an electrode array, you create a lot of heat. And the heat in these arrays can diffuse into the choroidal flu into the fluid, the vitreous fluid, whereas if it's tucked between the retina and the choroid, it's very easy for that heat not to escape. However, there's a German group. There are also big advantages to having an array on the other side of the retina, which a German group is working on. I'm just going to define three terms um, for people. One is current. Current is just pouring electricity into electrode. Charge is the amount of um, current that you're putting in within a single pulse. So for example, you can either have a very short, intense pulse with a high current, or you can have a longer pulse with less current, which will end up probably using more charge, as I'll talk about it. You don't want too much current, or you'll dissolve your battery, your electrode. That's bad. You don't want too much charge, or you'll drain your batteries. That's also bad. And finally, charge density is the amount of charge per unit volume. High charge density, actually it's high charge densities which are gonna dissolve your electrodes. So the more you make an electrode small, the more you have to deal with that issue. So as Jeff said in the beginning, when I joined the company, I knew they had patients. I knew when you stimulate electrodes, they said they saw something. But we really didn't know any more than that. So I knew there was a stimulus. I knew there was some kind of percept at the end. But I really didn't know anything. And so like Jeff, the first thing I kind of looked at is, do I have a measurable system? And because I was trained as a psychophysicist, my measurable system is, can I get, collect a psychometric function? So what I had is a pulse, 
I've got the negative first, that's the cathodic pulse, that's what seems to be effective for driving stimulation. So you start with a pulse that is pretty low in amplitude, and you say to the subject, can you see it or not? And they say yes or no, and if the pulse is low amplitude, they'll almost certainly say no. You have some false alarms, so you can get their guessing right. Then you make the pulse a little bigger, and maybe 30% of the time, the subject will say, yeah, I saw it, and the rest of the time, they don't. And finally, when you have a large pulse, 100% of the time they'll see it. And at the end, you have a psychometric function like this, and you pick off the point where 80% of the time or so that they say that they've seen it. And that's a kind of measurable threshold. Um, and you'll notice I'm using a yes-no, which for any psychophysicist in the audience, they're going to think, like, that's hokey. And the reason is, is that we were not allowed to collect data electronically. Because this was such a new technology, the FDA didn't know how to deal with electronic records for it. So we were writing everything down by hand. So we had to use the most kind of efficient way of getting our thresholds that we possibly could. And yes, no is actually a little bit more efficient than something like a two alternative force choice. So in this case, this patient could see, for this electrode, the patients could see a pulse at about 14.15 microamps. So the first question we had was some of our patients were, were great. They, could, they had really low thresholds. Some of our patients were terrible. They had really high thresholds. And we didn't, fizzy, how wonderful. And we didn't know why. And there were two theories out there, one of which was that the patients who had really high thresholds were older. Their, their retinas were more degenerate. They, you know, there was less cells to stimulate. But there was another very simple explanation, which was that we plant these arrays on the retina, and they're actually held down by a single tack. And we knew that, depending on the surgery, the arrays sometimes kind of lifted quite a long way off the retina, or in some cases kind of tilted almost completely off. And if you just think about the amount of current that's actually on the retina, if your array is up here and your retina is down here, not a lot of that current is going to reach your retina. And so you can do some very simple current modeling. And you can say, OK, what current is going to be required to produce one microamp on the retina as a function of the distance? This is in um, microns at the bottom of that scale. Sorry about the lack of access. So this is the height of the array from the retina. And this is the current required to produce one microamp on the retina. And you can see it climbs very steeply as your array starts lifting off. So first thing we had to do is measure the height of the electrodes from the retina. And as I showed you before, we have these fundus images, but we can also take OCT images on the retina, where essentially you shine a light onto the retina. The light bounces back through each layer, and by measuring the delay of the light when it comes off, you can measure how far down it was before it bounced back. And so here what you see, I love these pictures, is an array. It's kind of distorted on the retina. And you can see the shadows created by the four electrodes of the array. And we could thereby measure the height of the array from the, from the retina. This is a case where the array is pretty close down. And what we had to do is essentially, what we had is that image up there, where you can see that beam of light, which is the cross-section of the OCT image, and the OCT image. And then we had to basically align these two images and say, OK, that number one is lying on top of electrode A3 and so on and so forth. So it was this incredibly manual process that was done um, by um, a talented scientist who's now in Switzerland called Chloe de Balthazar. And essentially, the black line in this curve is essentially taken from the graph I showed you earlier. It's saying, what thresholds would we expect if the differences between our patients are simply based on how how lined the array is with the retina, how close it is to the retina. And then these dots are each different subjects. And you can see that each, and each of them are different electrodes on the subjects, or electrodes that have varied over time. Because the other thing we knew is these electrode arrays were shifting over time. So we would measure, we'd measure the height of the electrode and then correlate that with the thresholds for that electrode at roughly the same time. And what you can see is that current models actually provided a pretty good estimate of what was going on between our subjects. It certainly explained most of the variance. And essentially, my job was to go to the certain. And the other thing you'll notice is that as you go through the patients, the first patients have very high thresholds. 
And then the later patients have the low threshold. So I had to go to the surgeons and say essentially, so you can see that the blue and the purple have the lowest thresholds and the lowest electrode distances. And so I had to go to the surgeons and say, you need more practice before you start doing things that you have to do, you know, that this is the critical thing in success. So now we began with a box where all we knew we had is stimulation and a percept. So now we filled in one little bit of the mystery. We know that the basic overall thresholds depend on how high the array is from the retina, but there's still a whole bunch of mystery left. So the next question was a very simple one. We can have a small fast, full small fast pulse. We can have a long fat pulse. What do we want to do? How, does it, how should we do it? So we did a very sim second very simple experiment. You'll notice how conceptually similar this experiment is to the one Jeff described, where he presented these pulses of checkerboards that were ch varied in amplitude and duration. I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm presenting pulses that vary in amplitude and duration. Linear systems, it works for everything. <laughs> and essentially, my question was, can we fit this with the most simple model, which is a, called a leaky integrator model? And I call this the hotel bathtub model. Almost all hotel bathtubs have a little leak out the plug at the bottom, right? You know, whenever you have a hotel bath, it kind of goes down and down and down and down because the plugs always leak. So the idea is, is that when you pour current into an electrode or into a cell, when you pour current into a cell, some of the current is always just leaking away. So if you pour a lot of current in very fast, the bath will fill up very fast and you, the cell will then fire. If you pour water in a little less vigorously, it will fill up, but it will take a little longer. And you'll end up using more current or more water to fill the bathtub in the end. But on the other hand, you never had to go to very high currents, which are kind of difficult to deal with. If you have less current or less water, it takes a really long time to fill the bathtub, but eventually the bathtub fills and the cell fires. But finally, if you have very slow, you never end up filling the cell with current. You never end up causing the cell to fire. This is called the leaky integrator model. And you can see that it's actually a linear model. The, wa the water is leaving the bathtub, and the water is entering the bathtub at a kind of constant rate, in as much as I can do it in PowerPoint. So our question was, can we fit? pulse durations using this simple leaky integrator model. So we simply measured how much current we need for the subjects to see it at 80% correct as a function of the pulse duration. And as you can see, when you have a lot of current thrown into the cell very quickly, they need a high amount of current to see it. But they only, for, so if you, if, you, if you have a very short pulse duration, you need a large amount of current. But if you actually look at the amount of charge, if you multiplied that amount of current by the duration, you wouldn't actually need a lot of charge. Whereas when you go to the long pulse durations, you don't need much current to see it. But because that current's being poured in over a very long period, you end up using a lot of charge. And so that model, and then the curve you see there, is a fit from a simple leaky integrator model. So now we have the second part of our mystery box. So we're getting a little bit further between the stimulus and the actual perceptual response. I'm going to fast forward a few years because I want to finish on time. It stopped being linear after that, but it was still fit with a reasonably simple model. Basically, you have something that looks like adaptation. You have something that looks like a saturating nonlinearity. And you have a kind of slow thing that looks like perceptual integration. And the model as it, as it is looks incredibly similar to models that people have used to actually describe cells in the retina even though what we're doing is looking at something very, very different. But finally, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the thing at the end, the percept there. So I've been describing that percept up till now in this very reduced idea. It's simply how much stuff, how, what kind of pulses do I have to put in to just be able to see it? I know nothing about what it looks like. And a very talented um, graduate student of mine, um, kind of mine and Jim Wyland's, was really interested in this question of what the percepts look like. Because up till now, I've kind of been giving you the impression that a nice circular electrode will give you a nice circular percept. And that's a lie. So this is a case where you've stimulated two electrodes. 
and we've asked someone to draw on a board and then recorded the picture of the drawing. And you can see one, one of the electrodes produced something, a very nice dot, that's lovely, but the other one has produced this weird looking arc that really doesn't match what we want to see. And Diviani's idea was to say, well, maybe we can predict these percepts by looking at what we know about the retina. So this is a, pic a model of axon fibers in the retina. So every cell in the retina sends a cable to the optic nerve to go out of the eye. And these are the pathways of these tracts. Now imagine you have an electrode here. Before it stimulates a ganglion cell, here, here, and you imagine it's now stimulating, so there's the yellow. Well, underneath it's going to stimulate that yellow, green ganglion cell, okay? And if it only stimulate, if, if let current only stimulates cell bodies, that's great. But if it also can stimulate axons, if, you, if, if electrical current causes an causes an um, action potential, even if it's stimulating an axon, then you're also, hmm, oh, there you go, so you can see there, that you're also going to have to stimulate this blue cell and this red cell as well. But when you stimulate those cells, you don't see the percept in the position of the axon, of course. You see the percept in the position of the ganglion cell from which originated that axon. And so your percept is going to end up being an arc or an oval. Does that make sense? Okay. So what she did is a very simple but elegant experiment. She stimulates the cell. She has subject draw, a phos draw the picture of what it looked like. And then she made two predictions. One is what should we call a non-axonal prediction. It's what is this going to look like if we can't, if this current doesn't stimulate axons. And the other is the axonal prediction. So she's saying, well, okay, given where the array lies on the retina, which we knew from these um, retinal images, what would the percept look like? And you can see in that case, the percept looks very much like what you expect if you've got significant axonal simulation. Here's another example here. This time we're stimulating two electrodes. You can see one is producing a dot, one is producing an arc. The reason is, the cell that's producing a dot is very near the horizontal raphe, so there aren't actually a lot of cells, there aren't a lot of axons going through that location, whereas the one that is producing an arc is, it again, it's fit by this axonal model. Here's another example where you have two electrodes. They're separated by the same distance as the ones on the top, but because they're falling along the same tract of axon bundles, they end up producing a single percept, which is what the subject saw. So what she shows is that the percepts of these subjects is very consistent with the idea you have significant axonal stimulation. And as you can kind of see and can see intuitively from these images, this explains one of the reasons what, this is a real problem because where you stimulate is not necessarily where you see the percept entirely. So I think I've kind of given you a sense of here is this amazing technology. It is incredible that people who are blind can see anything again. But I think I've, I hope I've shown you that what we're not talking, we're, we're at the sort of, we're not even at the single slice yet. This is not site restoration. This is not site recovery. This might be site restoration, but it is not site recovery. Um, but it is an exciting time. It is a time when the field is opening up. There are amazing groups here in Italy, for example, working on technologies. People are now working on this problem very hard. A lot of very, very clever people. Second sight and prostheses are now actually being implanted within patients in USA and Europe. And other groups, such as the Zrenner group, are in um, kind of long-term, kind of not quite clinical trials, but preclinical trials. I'm not sure if they're technically clinical trials, but the, the, the prostheses are implanted for several months, but not implanted permanently. There are also very related technologies that may even be more promising out there, such as optogenetics um, and small molecules. And both of these essentially make the cells of the retina light sensitive, either by optogenetically modifying them or by directly opening and closing the channels based on um, light sensitive molecules. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening and congratulations again.
Jonah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these very stimulating talks. I will now uh, uh, pass the mic to uh, our director, Professor Giorgio Valortigana. Uh, um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to our speakers. Now we will turn to the use of Italian language in order to make uh, uh, the information available to the parents and the family of the, uh, of the doctoral students. Allora, eh, benvenuti, e, um, è sempre un grande piacere per noi il momento, è un momento speciale quello del uh, conferimento del titolo di dottore di ricerca ai nostri giovani collaboratori. È, come direbbero gli antropologi, un, un momento di rito di passaggio, hm? cioè il momento in cui formalmente eh, riconosciamo l'ingresso eh, di alcuni giovani nella comunità eh, dei sapienti, nella comunità eh, scientifica. E per quello che riguarda in maniera specifica le discipline che voi avete coltivato in questi anni, lo studio del cervello, e le neuroscienze, voi sapete e un po' tutti sanno, anche i non addetti ai lavori, che queste stanno conoscendo un momento di straordinario e rigoglioso sviluppo, e il che è comprensibile naturalmente perché lo studio del cervello e dei processi mentali è importante eh, per tutti noi, ci riguarda direttamente, noi siamo naturalmente affascinati intellettualmente che so, dalle nuove teorie cosmologiche o dal bosone di Higgs, ma i miei amici fisici mi perdoneranno, ma il bosone di Higgs è meno sexy, meno interessante di quel che succede dentro il cervello, perché quel che succede dentro il cervello ci riguarda direttamente, riguarda tutti noi, e ci riguarderà sempre di più negli anni a venire, ci riguarderà dal punto di vista biomedico e clinico, ci riguarderà dal punto di vista dell'educazione e della formazione, ci riguarderà probabilmente anche per quello che riguarda gli aspetti eh, del linguaggio e dell'uso della comunicazione. Eh, questo eh, ha anche, come dire, delle, delle conseguenze che a me piace ricordare perché, come dire, coltivo un certo gusto per l'understatement e per lo smorzamento dei toni emozionali di queste cerimonie. E cioè, è vero, le neuroscienze sono oggi terribilmente interessanti, però mi piace ricordare a tutti voi che nell'antico impero cinese, quando si voleva maledire qualcuno, si diceva ti auguro di vivere in un'epoca interessante. Questo non è un augurio, naturalmente, ma è solo per dire che negli anni a venire, a voi, giovani neuroscienziati, sarà richiesta sapienza, naturalmente, ma anche responsabilità. In bocca al lupo, ragazzi. Adesso credo di dover cedere la parola al professor De Florian, rappresentante del Rettore. Grazie e anche da parte mia buongiorno a tutti. Io sono qui a rappresentare appunto il nostro Rettore Reggente che non poteva essere qui e il Senato Accademico complessivamente. È per me sicuramente un piacere, un onore essere a rappresentare l'Ateneo in una cerimonia importante come quella che stiamo vivendo. Certamente senza voler eh, intaccare l'understatement prima citato credo che sia comunque un momento importante. Eh, dal punto di vista della vita universitaria credo che eh, siano eh, momenti importanti quelli eh, che portano al conseguimento di un titolo di dottore di ricerca. Voi sapete che in questo periodo si parla molto di eh, qualità, di ranking degli Atenei mh, e quando si parla di qualità e di ranking degli Atenei si parla spesso di qualità della didattica, di qualità del personale docente, ricercatore si parla forse non in maniera sufficiente del contributo che anche i dottorati di ricerca e i dottorandi danno alla qualità della eh, ricerca e della vita accademica all'interno di un Ateneo. 
e questo credo che invece dovremmo eh, ricordarcelo sempre più spesso. Quando qualche nostro dottorando come oggi finisce un percorso lungo e impegnativo è un pezzetto dell'Ateneo che eh, se ne va, è un rito di passaggio in effetti anche per noi. Eh, però ovviamente noi siamo orgogliosi e siamo felici che questo pezzetto della nostra storia, della nostra eh, università poi si disperda per il mondo, si disperda in altri ambiti accademici, in altri ambiti professionali, in altri ambiti in cui spendere le proprie competenze portando con sé qualcosa che rimarrà degli anni trascorsi eh, nel eh, svolgere l'attività eh, di dottorato in questo caso presso di noi. Quindi anche da parte mia e per conto dell'Ateneo chiaramente mi congratulo con chi oggi eh, solennemente finisce un percorso di dottorato e auguro sicuramente a, a tutti voi eh, un futuro professionale e anche umano che eh, sia di piena soddisfazione per voi e naturalmente mi associo alla soddisfazione che anche i vostri familiari oggi vivranno in un momento che comunque è importante anche per chi vi è stato vicino. Grazie. Allora, a questo punto eh, possiamo procedere alla consegna dei diplomi. Eh, e quindi eh, prima di tutto eh, chiamo Michela Malfatti. Congratulazioni Michela. E ora David Pascucci. Bene, la cerimonia è conclusa, eh, ringrazio eh, naturalmente il rappresentante dell'Ateneo, il professor Del Florian, il nostro direttore, il professor Valortigara e particolarmente uh, uh, our speakers che came here today uh, to uh, give us excellent talks. And uh, I invite you all, vi invito tutti al uh, buffet che è organizzato al piano di sotto. You're welcome.